We had a really large registration for this webinar today. We had over 470 registrants. So um, I just want to make sure to wait a few more minutes or a few more seconds really until folks get admitted. Okay, the number seems to be slowing. So I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the webinar to talk about the glossary of essential health equity terms. Um, the event is being recorded. And, you know, I, I was just thinking that even though we're calling it a webinar, it really is something a little bit uh, more interactive than what our typical webinars are. There will be very little talking um, by us as facilitators, and we will be going into breakout rooms and have some interactive components planned. Um, we're really hoping to learn from you about your impressions of, of using a tool like the glossary in your work and how it can advance health equity. But before we get started, we'll go to the next slide. And um, I really want to acknowledge that the NCCDH is on Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, we are at our host agency organization, which is St. FX University. And St. FX, of course, is also in Mi'kma'ki, which is colonially known as Antigonish, Nova Scotia. And recently I was in um, Saskatchewan for a few days in Saskatoon and Regina. And um, I had some really, really meaningful and enlightening conversations um, with Indigenous women um, privately out in the community, but also at a few um, official organizations. And, um, you know, I learned some things that I didn't know um, about the res school history of residential schools in that province about the history of colonization in that province and here in my own home province um, of Nova Scotia um, I recently attended the uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation celebrations at our closest First Nation which is um, Bakunkeg just outside of Antigonish and um, there I got to talk to some elders be part of some um, ceremony and drumming and speak to some kids and some of the women in the community. Um, so all to say that, you know, my commitment to this ongoing journey of reconciliation is um, continuing to develop relationships and continuing to um, try and get to know our communities uh, around us a little bit better um, and follow through on the land acknowledgement with some, some commitment. So if we can, um, with that, I think we are going to actually launch um, an interactive word cloud. Is that right, Pema? We've got Pema on, on board here. I'll be able to click back. Oh, that yeah. is right. I just wanted to say uh, we were experiencing a bit of a technical delay, um, Diane, which you may not uh, have realized, in um, people being admitted into the waiting room. So a few folks on the line may have missed um, your land acknowledgement um, and welcome there. Um, and just know that that was not intentional and that we all were very happy that you're here and please forgive us in the land of computer and Zoom delays. Um, today is a special day for all of us here at the NCCDH, but we think that we are on board for smooth sailing now. Um, yeah, and so thank you. I, no problem. Um, I'm just about to uh, launch this word cloud. And yeah, get your answers ready. Maybe Diane, while I'm doing this, you can just uh, ask them the question. Um, and if you look in the uh, in the chat box, um, you'll also see where to access this word cloud. Yes, that would be great. So thanks, Pema. And we are having um, some significant tech uh, challenges in the background here. So um, I wasn't aware there was a delay. Um, I also did want to say that um, you know introduce myself. So. Um, as the, the word cloud is being pulled up, my name is Diane Oikel and I'm a knowledge translation specialist with NCCDH. I'm also joined by my colleague, Carolyn Vossen, who is our uh, knowledge coordinator. Carolyn, if you can give a little wave or a hi. And um, I'll thank my team members, Hannah Claussen and Pema Mazundar, who are um, helping with the chat box functions and the tech functions. So as we get going here, um, one of the, the ways we want it to on your your knowledge and your perspective is to um, ask you to enter in a word here into this slido and as um, Pema mentioned 
There's a link in the chat box. And if you can keep this open during the entire webinar, there are a couple of um, other um, options and other things that we're going to um, come back to at this link. And really, we wanted to hear, as you can read from the question, what are some of the key health equity terms in your work? Just broadly, as you do health equity work in public health, um, in whatever community health, health-related field that you're representing, you know, what are some of those key concepts that come up? And by the way, as this is, I love watching the word clouds because I love seeing where um, folks' thoughts are and where um, the commonalities are. We will share this with you um, in a follow-up email for folks who are interested. Um, so I'm seeing, you know, social determinants of health. That is not a surprise. Intersectionality is a concept um, as one of the more major concepts. That's a little bit surprising to me, actually. Um, I'm pleased, but um, it's a little bit, a little bit of a, a surprise. Equity, of course, anti-racism. Keep going. Carolyn, what do you think of this? Yeah, I'm seeing some some key words becoming bigger here, social determinants, intersectionality, which is great because these are terms that are in our glossary. Uh, so we can speak a little bit more to those later. Yeah, Continue. accessibility and accessibility. Mm -hmm. Those are neat ones um, and very relevant. Again, I'm a little bit surprised because I um, I wasn't sure how common those were, you know, the lexicon and the narrative of, of folks who are out doing this work. This is really neat. So thank you. Keep, keep typing. But I think, um, you know, with that, if you've got any insights um, or any other comments about some of this that might surprise you, please feel free to add that to the chat box. Um, I love, really love, I'm really just still reading. I really love the trauma-informed practice. I really love anti-oppressive practice. This is really quite enlightening, actually. So this is great. So um, with that, um, I think we want to jump right into um, a first breakout room. And I, what we wanted to do here was get a little bit of your perspective on um, why it's important, before we dive into the glossary, before we dive into presenting some of the content, why it's important um, to have accurate and appropriate health equity terminology in our work, either through a glossary or through some other means. Um, and what we thought we would do is um, send everyone into breakout rooms with just two or three people. And we're going to stay there for about 10 minutes and um, discuss that exact issue. So why it's important to have that accurate terminology. Um, could spend a couple of minutes really briefly introducing yourselves, but um, then just talk about what that really means to you. And um, Pema, is are we okay to go to some? Yeah, I was just gonna say it's uh, again taking a little while for all, everybody to be admitted. Um, we have about 189 who have joined, and every few seconds more pop up needing to be admitted. Even though I'm admitting them as fast as I can, so I just was wondering. Um, I will send us into uh, breakout rooms, and then if others drop in, we will uh, maybe con continue that conversation in the main room, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, that would be great. I was just trying to come up with a workaround there. Okay, I'm going to send everybody to their breakout rooms now. Stay tuned. Great, thank you. Diane, some folks might have missed the question for the breakout rooms. Maybe we can just say it one more time before we go in. Sure. And you know what? I can uh, just type it in the chat box here as well. So the question really is, why is it important to have accurate and appropriate health equity terminology? So essentially, what does this mean? What is the importance of it? Why is it even something that we're talking about? And that's 
And I can also jump to um, each breakout room and just make sure that I say that question. Sure. I'm sure they all heard it. Um, others who are on the line, can you just, um, the other hosts who are on the line, can you watch the uh, waiting room for me? Okay, thanks. So, sorry, I'm seeing here that um, everybody's still here. I've opened the rooms a few times. I'm not sure um, what exactly is happening with them. I'm wondering if, um, Carolyn, Carolyn, can you try and open the rooms for me and see if uh, they're all prepped there, they're all ready. Um, they should be opening, but of course, today being today, they are not. And if it doesn't work, um, we'll give it to something else in a, in a few seconds here. Yeah. Um, Diane, if you do want to do that, I could share the whiteboard and invite everybody to write in it. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So instead of breakout rooms, <laughs> we're going to um, try and do the discussion on a whiteboard. And um, you know, this is, um, I, again, we just really appreciate everyone's patience. Um, the best laid plans uh, don't always follow through when it comes to tech. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the important thing here is that we connect about language and terminology and that we connect about the glossary. So um, let's try and do this uh, a little bit organically. So when I think about um, maybe I'll start because I've, I happen to own the mic right now. But when I think about why it's important, um, my mind immediately goes to um, one of the main purposes of developing the glossary. And that's really to develop consistent um, descriptions of some of those key health equity terms. And the whole idea is that if within a team, even within our own team at NCCDH, within a team, within organizations, um, within corporations, within government, if there's a consistent understanding about what some of those key concepts are around health equity, it's easier to talk consistently about how to address them. Um, the other part for me is that talking about and clarifying what these concepts really mean also helps us get at what the root causes of health actually are, um, instead of um, combining them or conflating terms and concepts, um, like we often do and sometimes in public health. So I'm seeing some really interesting things here. And as I read, um, Carolyn, I don't know if you want to comment. Um, I'm reading some really neat things on the list here about minimizing confusion, justice, um, stigma. I, I read earlier about um, sensitivity and being um, safe when it comes to, you know, talking with our communities that live with inequities. Being respectful, social justice, this is, and again, folks, we are happy to share um, what's being uh, shared here with you. We'll compile it and condense it a bit and send it out in a follow-up email. I'm looking in the, the chat box as well. There's a real culture of buzzwords. So this um, helps us to avoid being penalized by others. Yeah. And, you know, even equity itself is a buzzword. And I've um, something as core as that concept of equity. I have heard used um, in circumstances where it's not actually equity that's being talked about. But um, and, the, and the more we talk about some concepts, the, the more buzzy it can get. Right. So consistency and understanding common language. So lots around understanding and common understandings. Language is powerful. Are there, is there anyone, um, at keep, keep writing, keep contributing. Um, I know we have a large group here, but does anyone 
um, have questions or comments. If you do, I think raise your hand um, and I'll watch out to see if I see anyone. Um, we see one hand. Who's got their hand raised? Shabina, did you want to unmute and offer something? There. Hi, hi folks. Um, I, I'm really thankful for this workshop um, or webinar. And um, I, the one thing that I find um, there is still an obstacle is when we're talking about terminologies, it doesn't necessarily reflect the language piece mm -hmm. uh, because there are, um, you know, when you do the interpretation, it means something else in another language. And there are also spoken languages where these words don't exist, right? Even like when we are doing, um, um, you know, testing for a dementia, you're sh you would be showing photos. Those those animals, those certain pictures don't exist in, in the, where the folks are from. So um, there is there is still that obstacle. I just wanted to highlight that as well. But I, yeah. It's a very important obstacle. Um, it's very important. And we did, as we were developing the glossary, and I'll, I'll get into it, um, that is something that we wrestled a little bit um, as we were also creating the French version. But um, I was just at a conference last week in Regina and um, heard a very similar, um, similar sentiment around language and the existence of concepts within language and also, um, you know, with Indigenous languages and Indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, not to group them all is the same because there's a lot of diversity in there, but um, that the way that we know, so not just the language and words, but the way that we know about concepts um, across cultures and, and um, racialized groups, for example, and other groups that live in the inequities, the way that we know and understand these concepts is also really different, um, not just the terms. Any other comments? Is there another hand up there? I think Christian Hi. has his hand up. You're muted. Uh, yes, I was just going to thank you, uh, Carolyn. Uh, but I think, Shabina, I just want to add to what Shabina is saying is that I think it's not just about equity deserving groups or, or, or different populations, it's just the public in general. The one thing, uh, I'm new to public health. I, I came from uh, mental health. And one of the things that I, I, I tried to work really hard while I was working in the mental health field is to use plain language to speak about the work. Because as soon as you started to talk to somebody, even about just your job, like, what do you do? And then I started realizing, and just because I'm also English is, is my second language, I felt the exact same way that I felt sometimes in trying to interpret concepts. I was like, crap, there is, like, what's the plain way of saying this? Because people would just gloss over, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? And when I'm, for example, now we're doing engagement for collective impact, and you're trying to work with, say, a banker that might be wanting to support equity work, but also just, you know, a mom over here that, you know, is part of a collective impact process. Then you bring things like, uh, you know, some of the terminology that we use, uh, even health equity on its own. It's like, what is that that you do? You're the manager for health equity and indigenous reconciliation. And, you know, you lose them. So we need to find ways of, of, um, translating into plain language all the concepts that we're using as we engage with multiple stakeholders. And that might be politicians uh, or et cetera, et cetera. But I think I mean my, my point. Is. Thank you. That's a really interesting point. Um, and Caroline, I'm interested because Caroline does a lot of our communications related work, but um, it's resonating with me what you just said about how um, sometimes explaining health equity is like trying to learn your second language because um, I also speak French but English is my first language so as I'm trying to speak French it's really really hard for me to explain and I hadn't thought of it that way. Carolyn I see Deborah's hand up but Carolyn what do you think? Um, yeah I, I agree I think it's so important to think about the plain language and that the access to this language that we have in public health is not common across sectors. It's a privilege to have access to this language and to be able to understand and, and describe these sort of terms. And it's always important to look at 
whenever you bring up a conversation about the, these terms and this language, to see it as a, a learning opportunity for everyone, right? And, and share that conversation with community across sectors um, and not necessarily, you know, move away from that conversation or get uncomfortable if those words aren't matching up, right? It's meant to be a shared learning experience. We're meant to come together and start that conversation about language and discuss how do you understand this term, right? Have you ever heard this term before? And I think that's where the, the glossary can come in as that foundation, right? That conversation starter um, so that we can start to build a shared language across across different sectors. That's wonderful. I see Deborah's hand up. Maybe we could go to Deborah and then um, I think I'll dive into the, to the glossary. But Deborah, what's, what do you think? Hi, thank you. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a long, <clears throat> long, long, long-term public health nurse and um, working in health equity. And I've always thought um, that our jargon was incredibly complicated um, from the get-go. So I've always felt I was uh, in the, perhaps in the unconventional, but maybe truest sense of the word that my job was knowledge translation right from the, right from the term or the language that we used as opposed to, you know, what we think of as knowledge translation um, and have found, I, I start probably every presentation with um, key concepts and what they mean because there's such a diversity and when we started this work, there was so much confusion around people were sticking equity to anything <laughs> and 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 try and using them, you know, interchangeably. And it became very, very challenging. But one of the things that I found was very meaningful and um, effective was stories linked to the um, concept was more meaningful than any definition you could put to it. Because words are words, but stories tend to stay and become part of our learning uh, lexicon. And I, I really think they make um, that entire experience more memorable and, um, you know, uh, to, to use a, a phrase that comes up in nursing and Indigenous work and many other works is multiple ways of knowing. So I think the the stories have really, really helped. But um, yeah, I think languages are one of our biggest stumbling blocks. It's so funny because Carolyn and I were just talking about stories <laughs> to go along with this this morning and and in our days planning up to that. And so I agree. It's um, and I've heard that at more than one uh, table in more than one place that um, stories bring the concepts to life um, in many ways, and it gives them context. And, um, you know, I've got a few little stories in my in my bag of tricks when I do presentations to, to en enlighten on the concepts or try, try and explain what they are in practical terms. Um, so, you know, I'd appreciate any stories that folks have that they find effective. And we're, you know, I'm starting to think now about a repository of stories that might kind of help bring this to life. I'm seeing Christian with a thumbs up, so that's good. I think what I'll try and do now is share my screen um, and then uh, give you all a sense of what our revised glossary looks like. And then as we go into the next um, breakout, well, probably group discussion again <laughs> um, in a few minutes, maybe we can think about um, that stories piece um, and the application of it. So hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Carolyn, can you give me a thumbs up if, if it's coming through okay? Okay, excellent. So this is our glossary of essential health equity terms. So for folks who have been um, familiar with our organization and our tools for a while, this is the second iteration. We released a glossary, I think it was in 2015, and it was, um, I think, 12 or 14 terms. And this year, we revised and re-released it, and it now contains 32 terms. Um, there's been quite um, an evolution. This, this glossary looks quite different, and we went through a really extensive process in the development of this. It took over a year to do. Um, we did some internal consultations with our own team, but we did a lot of external consultations, a survey, um, some, I think we even did some focus groups um, to, to land on what core equity um, terms and concepts to, to rebuild our glossary around. And also um, 
the, the meaning of them, what should go along with them. So I guess as we dive in, please think of this as um, what we have now and with the intention of building onto it. This is not um, a complete directory of all relevant equity terms. These are what we consider to be the core terms that define our work. They are the, the descriptions and definitions are developed to inform public health work, so the work of our audience and our partners, but also our own work and also our own um, direction and, and the principles that we're grounded in as NCCDH. So this is an interactive page. It is possible to produce a, a PDF if you want. The idea is that these will be living descriptions and we'll revise them um, as the months and years go along. So certainly if we've got any feedback, then we'd love to hear that. You'll see here there is an acknowledgments and citation piece. Um, Carolyn and I worked really closely together on the development of this, and Carolyn was pretty instrumental in um, the launch of the page and uh, the construction of what's here. But she's been with me all along in the journey of um, this language and concepts around health equity. So to cite and acknowledge, we have that. And then you'll see a blue banner here. There's a couple of interactive features before we dive into the descriptions that I'll show you. Right here, you'll see where it says category. So essentially there are four categories and each category has a number of terms. This was our way of trying to group concepts together to help guide the use of the glossary, but also the application of, of the terminology. So we have a group of terms around key concepts, a group of terms around the roots of health, relative influences on health and interventions and strategies. You can also search, um, you'll see the search term here. You can search either for one term in its definition or you can search for a concept. So if I search for racism, for example, it will bring up not just the definition but also any other definitions that refer to that concept. So if folks want to link descriptions to each other, link other descriptions that mention racism to other concepts, um, that, is, that is a piece that's built in. Um, back up here by the same search box, you'll see this print glossary that I won't click it, but that will produce a PDF of all of the definitions. It's not a friendly, pretty looking one. It's um, it's very functional. The idea and our hope is that people would use this live and interactively online. But if you need to print it for later reference or offline reference, you can do that um, if, yeah, if necessary, if that's helpful to you. So within key concepts, we've got four main or five main terms. We um, describe health, population health, health inequity, health equity and health disparity. I'm going to get rid of the, the, um, the racism prompts so we can look a little more clearly. Under roots of health, here we're, we're focused on social determinants, structural determinants, which is a new, a new concept um, compared to our old glossary, uh, intersectionality, racism, marginalization and vulnerability. Under relative influences, we've got advantage, disadvantage, privilege, oppression, um, and you can see the rest. And that the idea in this category, where there's seven, is um, the relativity of different forces of privilege and oppression, advantage and disadvantage, and that there really are both sides when it comes to the forces that create equity or inequities. And then interventions and strategies is where we get in a little bit to um, the ways that public health can work with communities to address some of the inequities. These are still broad interventions, so there aren't specifics in terms of you know, program type, for example. It's more the broad types of strategies, so approaching things um, from an intersectional or intersectoral action, um, approaching interventions at upstream, midstream, or downstream levels, proportionate and targeted universalism. So these are um, will hopefully appeal to both you know, seasoned public health folks, but also to um, folks new to working within public health and new to working within equity. So th it was a bit of a balance in developing the descriptions. Um, below you'll see there is a complete um, list of references, but what I will do is I'll bring up one definition for community engagement for health equity. So what you'll see here is that um, there are citations within each description and um, 
if you click one citation, it will take you down to that so you can see the source of where that pieces come from. And if you click the little arrow, it will go back up. So um, that's an important piece for the integrity of the glossary is that we've we've linked the concepts to the original source where it's not linked to another citation that's um, come from within NCCDH. And also you'll see there's a list of related resources um, that goes along with each definition. So other pieces of work from NCCDH that support these concepts. And that's essentially it in terms of functionality. It's a lot to go through. So I'd encourage you to um, open it up, spend some time playing, send us some feedback, get in touch with us if you've got questions. Um, the other piece that I will mention is that this, what I've just demonstrated is the English glossary of essential health equity terms. There is a French version. It is not a direct translation of the English version. And in fact, it's different. Um, there are some terms that are a bit different. Um, and what we did is a very, we have done a presentation on the French glossary and there is a recording available. So we can share that link in the follow-up email with you as well. Um, knowing that we did a separate but parallel process. So we did some focus groups, we did a survey with our Francophone audience specifically to find out how these terms would resonate. Um, and we made changes based on their feedback and we made descriptions based on their feedback so that it would um, be relevant to the Francophone context. So, you know, just thinking about the earlier comment, yeah, and thanks Pema, this is perfect. Thinking about the earlier comment um, around language um, that Shabina had made, um, this is one way we did it with French. We did not do it with other groups, however. So that's that's a consideration. So now that you know a little bit about the tool, um, what it is, um, how to access it, what we want to know from you is, you know, have you used either this glossary, the current version, or the previous version? Um, if not, how could it be used? What are some ways that a tool like this can support work on health equity. And I'm seeing, hi, Caroline. Caroline, nice to see you. Um, how did we decide which reference to draw on for the definitions? Was there room for community or lived expertise consultations? So as folks are answering um, on the discussion board here about uses, um, maybe I'll address Caroline's question. Um, so how we decided was we did, um, we started with a lit review and a lit scan of um, other health equity related glossaries that existed, but also some of the terms that we were having difficulty finding um, current and relevant um, descriptions for. We um, did specific search for literature to define those terms. So things like intersectionality, of course, that that had a specific literature review. We also have a, a product on that. And so some of that lit review um, was built into some of our other project work. Mm -hmm. um, other terms like, um, I'm just looking at the glossary here to think of one. So proportionate universalism and targeted universalism, which are well used. We um, did lit searches specific to those terms. Um, was there room for community consultation? Yes. Yeah. So um, we, in the folks that we reached out to, um, either by survey or focus group, um, to review the, the descriptions, but also to help us decide which terms, um, we really tried to make sure that um, folks who were consulted um, represented people who live with inequities. So we tried to make sure there were um, Indigenous folks, there were folks from the African Canadian uh, community that there were folks um, from the immigrant and newcomer community. There were folks who um, either worked with or had experienced um, living in um, underhoused situations or in adequate and precarious housing. We did not do a broad community consultation though. So um, there was room and there was some and um, there would be room for more. Carolyn, did you, do, can you comment on that any further? Have I missed anything in our process? No, I don't think you've missed anything, Diane. Um, so I'm just looking at comments. Share the position of using plain language in Nunavik. Oh, wonderful. So Robert, that was that's a great comment and he's offered up his email um, to be connected. And someone commenting, darling, commenting, 
sharing and please do share. Um, so I'm looking at some of what's coming in um, around the uses and how it's been used. Um, any questions or comments from folks that you want to add to what's coming from the screen here? I'm interested to hear, has anyone got a story of how they've used it when it, um, I don't know if Robert, um, Robert, you made the comment, if he's still on, um, did you want to mute, unmute your mic and uh, offer anything further? I mean, I can certainly offer how we've heard that, that some folks um, use it, but um, I would really like to hear from other folks. I'm looking at one point of view that um, someone has used it to inform their work, but staying clear of terminology that increases the hierarchy between races or among social groups. And um, I would really love to hear more about that, either in the chat box or verbally. Um, because I love that, um, I love that idea of seeing sort of things that will increase the hierarchy. Maybe while I'm waiting for a, a hand raise, um, I see the question around who's the intended audience or knowledge user. So that's um, it's a great question. Um, the intended user or audience for the knowledge. So our NCCDH, our audience really broadly is the public health sector at all levels. So. Um, all of our products are really designed with that broad audience in mind, and that includes researchers in public health, practitioners, um, leaders, either formal leaders or informal leaders. Um, also, those you know, organizations that work with public health, so community organizations, um, other sectors that work with public health, but it's certainly in um, public health language, it's in public health speak, <laughs> and it's certainly designed for use and pick up by all levels, frontline practitioners, um, researchers, program planners, evaluators, I'm thinking of my days back in frontline, um, across, it is not profession specific, um, and it's not discipline specific or level specific. So it's a broad audience and a broad use. I'm seeing the comment about, we use the glossary for internal work and collaboration um, and use more plain face language facing with external. Yeah, that's a really, Victoria, that's a really, really good point. Carol, did you have anything to add in terms of, of um, audiences? Not in terms of audiences. I think you, you covered that you know, our typical audience is, is public health. That's who we're reaching. We're reaching public health organization level um, audiences, but our hope is to expand that audience with this tool, this learning tool, um, you know, to folks that are not typically within our audience, maybe students, community organizations, um, front-facing health service workers. So I'm, I think we're everybody and anybody, right, that wants to learn a bit more about health equity language. And yeah. uh, I saw Christian's hand up. Oh, great. Do you still uh, want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, that I, I think it's about um, where I see terminology is important. I, I mentioned things like, you know, being able to assess and evaluate our work and then share information is crucial. And so we do need the jargon because we have a specialized uh, field and and at least to do our work internally as as practitioners of, of public health we need to be able to have consistency of terms so that we can even say measure the same things right so that we can say okay this is this worked this intervention worked here and then we can use it somewhere else now the word like intervention is jargon and so uh, but the one thing is that I, I think is we tend to say I came from from uh from healthcare and healthcare practitioners talk to their clients like they're healthcare practitioners. And we gotta stop doing that, right? We cannot, we gotta talk to them as recipients of a service and we are their service, right? So we need to ensure that they are, you know, they, they're, we're eliciting uh, their support, that we understand what they're saying to us. I mean, it is about relationship with respect. So some of those pieces that I think people have been saying on the side about 
there's all kinds of bias in the way that we go about doing our work and we have to be aware of our bias and we need to be aware of the bias as we communicate with whoever our audience might be. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one thing uh, uh, to share a story because we talked about stories that where I was talking about, you know, plain language is also there. There's implicit, there's biases in that language because it speaks about, you know, plain sometimes is considered less sophisticated or less intelligent, but it's not, you know, that's not, I mean, I don't agree with that, but I could see how that can be the case. But I, I remember hearing a politician and in, in, uh, she's a city council in Buenos Aires that used this, this terminal. She actually is, I think, an excellent practitioner of, of, of health equity uh, as a politician, but she, she doesn't, she wouldn't know that she's a, a public health practitioner, but she's talking about social determinants of health. And in a speech, she was talking about three things she, she talked about, and I'll say it in Spanish because it, there's alliteration. Um, tierra, techo, y, y trabajo, which means land, uh, like a roof over your head, and and work. And when you know she was talking about this these projects they were doing uh, within this um, poor area of the city, that at the end of the day, that's that's it for them to be where they wanted to be. They needed a plot of land that they could own, right? Uh, a house over their heads and the work that would sustain that those things, right? And you know, with the with work, they could access education and and food, et cetera, et cetera. That's social determinants of health. But she never used those terms. And everybody in that audience, in that in that space, knew exactly what she was talking about. And not only that, but it was a goal-oriented discussion because those three things were the end goal of everything they were doing to try to move. So to me, that's like, that's we need to learn to kind of speak in those ways. So when we're saying we're mobilizing people towards something, with something very concrete like, you know, housing, you know, stable, like affordable, right? Um, and leave the jargon whenever we can, only for us when we're talking shop. Because we can talk, it's okay for us to talk shop, I think. Thanks for that, Christian, I agree. Um, I heard a few things in what you were saying. So the first thing that I noted down was we need to make sure amongst professionals that we're measuring the same thing. And that comes with a common understanding of these terms that we're talking about. And Diane and I have spoken about, um, and we've also heard a story from a group who is working on a health equity related project. And they went all the way through their project using these terms, using these buzzwords, and they got to the end and they actually spoke about the terms and the language and kind of what they were hoping as their end goal. And that's when they realized they hadn't been on the same page about these terms. And so they were, the whole group of them, individuals, were working towards actually separate goals, even though they were using the same language. So I think the main idea here is that this glossary is a learning tool. It's not meant to be the be all end all. Um, it's meant as a starting point to to spotlight how important language is at the beginning of any work that you do, right? And to make sure that everyone is has a common understanding and a shared understanding. And that was what I was seeing in this some of these answers to the questions. Um, so we're all on the same page here. And the second thing that I got out of of what you were saying was that power and power structures is baked into language. And we need to make sure that when we're communicating uh, with community and with folks who don't have access to this language, um, that we are either adapting the terms that we're using or, you know, going to them. What terms do you use to describe your situation? What terms do you use to describe the inequities that you're experiencing within the system, right? So. I think to just to end off my thoughts, um, we just need to go to the community. We need to center the community that we're serving in in these conversations about power, so and and language, um, and come back to them with the words that they understand and that they use to describe themselves. Public health and health services is in the position to give guidelines, 
but we're not in the position to dictate how people describe the situation that they're experiencing and the situation that they're in. Diane, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, what you've both said, um, Kristen and Carolyn, is, is um, exactly in my mind. And there's so many, <laughs> as Carolyn and I have been working on this over the past few months, there's, it's, it, it, there's so many um, aspects to language and terminology that relate to each other, you know, and, and as much as we've developed this as a glossary, which is a list of terms and some associated descriptions, we can't isolate this from the context of its meaning um, and the context of its, its relevance. And I saw a comment in the chat box, I think from Robert, that, you know, there's some concern that as we use terms that are considered irrelevant by Inuit or other Indigenous communities, for example, are we recolonizing by using and imposing terms and language that are irrelevant to that group? So that's a really powerful statement. Um, and it's a really important aspect of what Carolyn was talking about and what we've talked about, about how power is really baked into the language that we use in public health. And, you know, it's baked into the way that we impose language and terms. It's baked into some of the, the words that we use to describe, um, as Carolyn was saying, you know, describe some um, of the groups that live with inequities that we work with. So what the glossary does not do, just to clarify, it does not do and does not pretend to do is, um, you know, state how to refer to particular groups, because absolutely 100%, that really needs to be, um, it needs to be directed to us by those groups and communities need to lead um, and need, they need to state what and how to describe them. Um, but, you know, as much as we're trying to separate power from terms, there is still going to be power baked into the terms, even in the glossary, because they apply to, you know, in my case, um, you know, I'm a white English woman that works in public health. And so certainly there's going to be that aspect, right? So, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, really powerful piece um, to reflect on. And I'm looking, I'm just looking at comments in the, in the box here. Um, yeah, so it's, it's powerful and it's, um, yeah, it's powerful and it's important. Any other comments? And I think I'm here. I just yeah. unmuted myself because I don't think I can raise my hand <laughs> as a host. Um, I just wanted to respond to some to, to that same uh, the great discussion um, and the comment that was made, I think, by Christian about um, if we measure it, then we can, if if we define it. I heard and I liked. I love the take homes that Carolyn had out of his comment. Um, I heard a little nuance, which I just want to put out there as like a kind of caution for all of us. I think language is super important. I agree that culture and, and power is baked into it. Um, and I also think that just because we have a good definition or a common, we all agree on that definition. Um, I think it's, it's we as public health, it's just like a little caution. I've seen so many of us spin our wheels for so long on, let's just get the language right. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that is going to translate into this, this like racism is going to be measured and for sure acted on. Um, and some of those, some things like racism and, and uh, I guess even climate change, and I'm thinking of all those other structural determinants, um, are, there's so many different ways of measuring different aspects of them that I don't know if it's all up to the perfect definition. So I just, I just wanted to put that out there as like a little extra thing to think about, but I'm very grateful for the glossary and I'm, I'm seeing so many good um, uses that I hadn't even thought of in the comments and in the in the, um, the Slido which which was up there for a while yeah which is excellent and again we'll we'll condense and share that thank you Pema that's that was really important context Shabina did you want to ring in again yes please um, I think this is great this is a great uh, document. Uh, my uh, suggestion would be uh, for the health um, authorities to go further, a step further, and reach out to Indigenous and racialized communities and include them in this and see how we can work and incorporate 
these languages in other languages, and that can be even more beneficial for all the communities. Hmm. That's a really that's a really great suggestion. Would you would you suggest how what's a good way to go about that? I guess so. Part of me thinks you know take this to um, some of our indigenous partners and get their perspectives, but then it's not starting in the indigenous place, right? It's starting with with what we've got and asking for input. So does anybody have any ideas on what a good way, a good strategy to do that? Um, sorry, can I chime in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so um, health authorities, they have a mandate to have an interpreter present when they're uh, working with um, uh, folks uh, with language barriers. So I think that would be a good place to start. Um, how they hire the interpreters, which agencies they work with, and just go from there. And for the indigenous uh, community, um, there is, um, you know, the indigenous health authorities connect with them. Nice. Yeah, excellent. Any other comments to that? I see a hand up from Caroline. Okay, hey, Caroline. Hi, um, yeah, I should lower my hand. I think I, in terms of uh, working with indigenous communities, my own experience from trying to use a Western and mainstream tool for collaboration is that be ready for them to say this doesn't work for us at all. That a glossary, uh, I mean, a glossary is almost the antithesis of oral and narrative-based discussions. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that's harder to share as a knowledge. So I don't know if you need to have the answers, but I wonder if it makes sense to reach out to them to say, what can a glossary look like from an Indigenous perspective? And I think just those conversations are really good for trust building and for rethinking and unlearning and relearning. I don't think, you know, it has to be about this glossary being adapted. I think it's probably about, can we also take learnings from this for other pieces? That's, that's really important and, and something in what you just said made me think, you know, so that the whole purpose and goal of this glossary is to get to a better under and common understanding of the concepts. And maybe for some groups, a glossary itself just isn't even relevant. You know, is there a different way for so many communities that we can get to that more common and consistent understanding of, of concepts? without a glossary completely. So, you know, um, you know, forgetting our, uh, our current format and instead talking to groups about, okay, what does true community engagement actually mean to you, right? And having that conversation. What does health equity mean? What does health mean to you? I mean, the first definition we've got in here is of health. And that's, you know, that's essentially how NCCDH defines health and how it applies to our work, but health is going to mean something different for communities. So maybe in some cases, it's not even using the glossary. It's actually going away from it and talking and, and exploring concepts in a different way. Um, I see Carolyn nodding her head, but I want, Deborah's got her hand up. So maybe we'll go to Deborah and then, um, yeah, Carolyn, if you've got to add. So um, I just had a wee bit of a flash during this conversation, going back in time a bit to when the social determinant of health um, um, Oh, sorry, having a menopausal moment. Um, uh, the definitions came out and, you know, like this organization had, you know, these were their social determinants of health they were working from in this organization. And there was a lot of the same kind of conversation um, that the, um, sorry, I'll give you my face, um, that uh, trying, to, trying to say, trying to find the one fit size, one size fits all hat. And it was sort of, I think at the time people were just, um, there was a lot of work that was being directed to be done without a lot of framework. So we were all a little desperate to find something that we could all hang our hats on and have some mutually uh, understood language and so on. But I think what came out of that is what I'm hearing coming out of this, which is we have to recognize that um, there was no perfect one single common common tool or common glossary or common list and instead we had to look at it more as what's most appropriate for the work we're doing so for example 
when we were working with indigenous communities, we were saying, okay, what kind of um, determinants of health have you um, developed or compiled and looked at those, which were very different in some regards than, than the ones that, for example, public health had adopted. Um, you know, they were missing, you know, colonialism and, you know, a bunch of those kinds of things that were much more relevant. And I think the same thing applies for a glossary. So what you had said, Diane, is, you know, sitting down and coming up with, you know, that that sort of storming and norming and forming kind of work that we do so well in public health, I think. It's one of the things we do pretty good, um, which is bringing uh, community and groups together and saying, what does this mean for us? What are we going to, you know, all agree on? Um, and that's what we're going to work towards. And our role, I think, in public health is to be able to then take that, turn it into the formal or um, profession-driven language we need to in order to, you know, get our outcomes measured and get our funding renewed and the things we need to do with that. But when we're working with clients and community and partners, it needs to be a living, breathing organism. And so I think it's very hard, I think, for one organization to come up with something that's going to fit all of those needs. And so that's why I think that's one of the skills that public health practitioners um, should be, could be, would be bringing to the table. Oh, I'm on mute. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you, Deborah. Carolyn, you were were you going to comment on something? And then I actually wanted to address a, a comment in the chat box, but you go ahead. Okay. Uh, just based on what I was hearing, Diane, I was wondering if you wanted to um, just give a little bit of an introduction into the let's talk power of language work that we're doing. Yeah. Um, because a lot of what we're hearing is kind of where that is leading to in terms of uh, facilitating convenings or conversations between um, capital public health um, and community um, and you know, having those conversations and facilitating those conversations about discussion and about adapting the glossary. Um, and then potentially what would come out of that would be you know, some steps that um, public health can take to have these conversations within um, the community and within the self-location that they're in. Um, again, because the glossary is just one tool um, and it's mostly focused towards or um, prioritized for our audience, our main audience, which is public health. Yeah, and so you just did a, a beautiful job of describing some of, you know, the, the next steps. Um, and it builds a little on the, the one comment I did want to um, follow up on. Terry put a comment in asking about how it will be shared with the workforce. Um, you know, that there's work around the skills enhancement online course that that previously existed, um, may still exist in archive, um, and the upcoming public health competencies work. So, so this is one of the ways we're sharing the glossary is, um, you know, through the webinar, we've done some um, mass, more mass promotion through our newsletter and some of our networks. We'll continue to do that. Um, as the recording of this webinar comes out, we'll re-promote the glossary um, and we're integrating it into some of our own upcoming projects, which is another way of, of getting it out. Um, we're always willing um, to do um, any workshops or any presentations to any groups that might be um, interested in it. But one of the ways that we're going to build on this work, um, so so sorry, also as the public health core competencies work, they are being revised and CCDH will be um, one of the lead agencies involved in that. And so certainly um, some of the descriptions for some of these core concepts will, will inform the revision of the core competencies. Um, it'll also inform the revision of our own online um, Introduction to Health Equity Online course, um, which is a um, the next sort of, it followed when skills online um, ceased to exist, I guess not closed down, but um, ceased to operate. And, and one of, um, and I know that we're at time, so in terms of next steps, um, we currently have a document called Let's Talk Populations and the Power of Language. Carol and I are working together um, to revise that document, and it's really going to be reframed into a language of health equity document. Not another glossary, but more about the, the concepts we've been talking about, that power is baked into language, 
how to um, talk about inequities in a way that is respectful and how you know the language that we use um, to talk about inequities really reflects our personal values as well as our institutional and organizational values for the communities we work with for the people that we're trying to um, we're trying to engage with and for the inequities that we're trying to address. So we will be working on that. The other piece um, that's coming is sometime in the, the new calendar year, um, we will be doing a series of conversations similar to this, but building on this about the use and application um, of health equity language, what that looks like now, what it could look like, how we can do that in a way that will more advance our efforts on health equity. Um, and how we can do it in a way that's respectful. So um, there are there are future um, steps happening when it comes to this work. I know folks are um, nearing the end. Um, I can see that my colleague Hannah um, put a link to the evaluation, I think, in the chat box. So we'd really, really love to hear from you any thoughts you have. Um, Carolyn and my NCCDH team, is there anything final that we we can uh, send folks off with. I think just keep an eye out for those those next projects and the, the next work that we're doing because it will start to cover a lot of the conversations that we've been having here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and feel free to, to reach out to us, um, yeah. Diane and I, as we start to develop that work, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah. yeah, really great yeah. discussion today, though. I enjoyed it. Very, very helpful um, for today. Very helpful for our next steps. Um, and what Carolyn said, that we're wide open to any feedback, including feedback that's critical or questioning. Um, you know, we draw on our audience to, to advance the work, and it needs to be useful for you. So, um, yeah, call anytime. And there's a few folks I'm going to follow up with. So um, thank you again for your patience as we met, uh, pivoted as literally in live time as this thing went along. So um, we that collaboration and patience. Thank you everyone very much. Thank you and thanks Christian. Great feedback today. Bye everyone.